In this lecture, we'll survey the literary and historical context of realism in preparation for our discussion of Higuchi Ichiyo. Higuchi Ichiyo wrote during the Meiji period, which is the period that follows immediately after Matsuo Basho's Edo period, or Tokugawa Shogunate. You'll remember that during the Edo period, the Tokugawa shoguns ruled Japan. The Meiji period is marked by the restoration of power to the emperor of Japan. It's also marked by many rapid modernizations and reintroduction to the West. In 1853, a little bit before the Meiji period begins, Commodore Perry of the U.S. Navy arrived in Japan and brought an end to Japan's isolationist trade policy. This encounter with the West made Japan aware of the imperialist agendas of Western powers, but Japan wanted to remain autonomous. They wanted to prove that they are a formidable power themselves, equal even to the Western powers. And so the Meiji government endeavored to modernize. The word Meiji itself means enlightened rule. And so during this period, we see the assimilation of Western technologies and science. Telegraph and telephone lines are installed, railways are built, and Japan transforms itself into a modern industrial state. And just as we see in the Enlightenment period, of other countries. As a result of modernization, Japan undergoes changes that facilitate social rights and mobility. A new legal system is implemented, a new ministry of education is established, newspapers spring up to circulate the most recent debates about the governance of the modern state, Western fashion is incorporated, men begin wearing bowler hats, women begin wearing petticoats, and people are being sent abroad to be educated in Western universities. By the end of this period, as with other Enlightenment periods, we see Japan moving away from an absolute monarchical structure towards a constitutional monarchy. During the Meiji period, Japan also built up its military, and driven by an anxiety to prove themselves as an equal imperial power, began looking overseas to expand. They engaged in several wars during the late 19th century, including the Sino-Japanese War and Russo-Japanese War, with China and Russia respectively. They were fighting over Manchuria and Korean territories for imperial expansion. They even used the social Darwinist arguments of the West to support their imperial goals, just as those in the West argued that it is the duty of superior races to to rule over and enlighten inferior races. As we know, the imperialist policy of Japan came to a halt in 1941 during World War II, but up to that point, Japan not only engaged in these wars with China and Russia, but won them as well, shocking the world over and proving themselves to be a powerful East Asian player in the international theater. The point of all this is to get us thinking about how Japan wanted to modernize themselves while also maintaining a sense of Japanese identity. The Western encroachment, Western enlightenment, and modernization, the desire to prove one's imperial prowess against the West, all of this complicated matters and galvanized Japan's desire to cultivate a national identity. As with other Enlightenment periods, we also see the move towards realism in literature. Now, Japanese realism is influenced by the nation's own literary heritage, as well as the literature of Western countries and influences. However, realism is one of the first aesthetic movements that is truly global, and so there are some commonalities regardless of country of origin. The most basic definition of realism is that the literature must give a faithful representation of reality. As we saw when we began discussing the novel with Voltaire, the novel being a realist genre, realism typically avoids the implausible and impossible. There usually isn't any magic or fantasy. Instead, what we might see are gritty or down-to-earth representations of life. No idealizations here. We usually see a lot more of the common classes rather than focus on kings and courts, although this doesn't mean we don't see any upper-class people, and the language is usually written for the common masses, nothing in Latin or classical Chinese or classical Japanese. Realism was inspired by the sciences and technologies of the 19th century. For instance, the camera showed that we could capture reality exactly as it is, but the more people began using the camera for art, the more they realized that the camera shot still depends on the photographer. That is, there's so much to reality that an artist can't help but influence our perspective of reality by choosing to show or choosing not to show certain aspects of it. The same thing goes for realist literature. The basic idea is to give a faithful representation of reality, but what counts as a faithful representation differs author to author. For instance, some authors may feel that one should focus on social relations between people, while others may feel that they should explore the madness of the internal mind. The way emotions are depicted can differ between authors and countries as well. Some authors may be flamboyant and extravagant in their emotional scenes, while others may be more subdued, allowing the reader to fill in the gaps themselves.
Japanese literature, then, as mentioned, is shaped by its own literary heritage as well as the heritage of the West. If we start with the haiku, for instance, we'll see how Japanese literature has already been beginning to focus on speaking to and about the common people. This emphasis on the common people is also a derivative of Confucian thinking, which stresses the importance of everyone being aware of others, particularly the suffering of others. This is that Confucian idea of empathy, especially towards those who may be lower in social status than oneself. The haiku can also be considered realistic in the way that it sketches scenes and experiences, describing them as they are, so that readers may likewise gain an immediate holistic experience of the described moment. This kind of realism stresses the author's role as just a medium, simply relaying the narrative as it is without coloring or clouding it with one's own aesthetic or moral impressions or judgments. The language should also be unvarnished, stated simply rather than decoratively, in order to once again be as true to the events and experiences as possible. With Japanese realism, we'll also see a move from poetry to prose, which will help writers to speak more clearly to the common masses than before. And in the end, the ultimate goal is to allow the reader to come to their own conclusions. Now, Japanese realism rises during a time when Japan is seeing a great influx of Western culture. The naturalist Amil Zola was popular, as were the Russian realists Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Some say Japan's realism is a general absorption of cultural heritages as it emerges during this globalizing time, and thus we'll see some vacillation between what the West would call realism and what the West would call naturalism. Western realism in general focuses on issues of society and self. This kind of realist literature focuses on depicting the trials and joys of human life and society as humans in a city, with or without a family, struggling against the legal system, struggling against disease or addiction, striving to make a name for oneself, etc. In short, it strives to find meaning in reality. Naturalist literature in the West is typically much more fatalistic. It takes direct inspiration from the sciences and agrees that human life is no more significant than any other animal, plant, insect, or rock that keeps this world going. We're all part of the same ecosystem. And just as Alexander Pope said in Essay on Man, it is only the human ego that causes us to believe that this world should have meaning for us. So a popular way to reconceptualize the human identity was to realize that humans are simply animals. In the West, this was a shocking concept that stressed the idea that humans are not noble or divine, but brutal, greedy, lustful, murderous, cheating, and so forth. When we take this idea that humans are just animals and put it in an Eastern framework, though, it becomes less shocking. Traditional religions of the East typically already admitted the weaknesses of humans and their similarities to animals. So what gets stressed then is the idea of biological determinism. This is the idea that if the universe is entirely mechanical, as opposed to divinely inspired, then every process, system, and action should be predictable. Eventually, once our math and scientific knowledge gets advanced enough, we should be able to calculate everyone's next move and ultimate fate. In literature, this concept is explored as authors experiment with the ideas that we are all shaped by our heritage and environment. For instance, the literature might explore whether we can escape our social classes or whether we are instead fated by some kind of biological code that prevents us from being kinder, more successful, or more accepted by society. So in Japanese realism, we might not see the sordid coarseness of European naturalists like Amil Zola, but we will see an exploration of human nature and what that means. Note to that the objectivity and detachment of a naturalist perspective in a way meshes with the aesthetic of earlier Japanese literary traditions like the haiku and the Buddhist concept of emptiness. These aren't perfect analogs, but in Japanese realism we can see how the two sides come together to form a narrator who strives to give a value-free examination of human nature, to not depict it as good or bad, but to depict it simply as it is. As Japanese naturalist Kosugi Tengai says, Nature is nature. It is neither good nor bad, neither beautiful nor ugly. Good and bad, beautiful and ugly are merely arbitrary names given by a particular person in a particular country and particular epoch to one part of nature. Whether the reader is moved or not is not a matter of concern to the poet. He should relate what he imagines just as it is. Because what would happen if a portrait painter said, your nose is too big and planed it off? When reproducing the imagined, not the least personal may be added. <laughs> 
Many naturalist authors came from impoverished families. Higuchi Ichio is no exception. Her family was doing well for a little while. They came from the peasant class, which in traditional Japan is low, but not as low as, say, butchers and undertakers. The family moved to Edo, the capital of Japan, in 1857, and the father found work as a bureaucrat. However, he invested his money in a business that failed and then died of tuberculosis, a disease that shortly after took Ichio's brother, leaving her and her mother and sister to fend for themselves. They begin doing laundry and sewing to get by, even opening a stationery shop at the edge of the pleasure district, but this failed. When things were looking their worst, it was Ichio's writing that started to help pull the family up. Ichio had read widely when she was young. She attended poetry groups and apprenticed herself to a writer who was himself behind the times. Without getting any exposure to Western literature and without much guidance from her teacher, she develops her own poignant sense of realism and adopts the name Ichio, which means one leaf, a name that recalls the Buddhist concepts of unity and enlightenment. She became incredibly popular during her time. She had fan clubs and signed autographs, but before she could get very far in her writing career, she, like her brother and father, dies of tuberculosis at the age of 24. Our Story, Separate Ways, was published just before she died.